Uh, good evening, everybody. Mike Smith's my name. I'm from the New Zealand Fabian Society, and it's my um, pleasure and privilege to uh, welcome everybody to tonight's session with uh, on your Honourable um, uh, Matt Robson, uh, former Minister of Disarmament in the two, 1999 to 2002 Labour-led government. Uh, and Matt's topic tonight that we've asked him to speak on is an independent foreign policy for Aotearoa and New Zealand. Um, we're saying New Zealand has long prided itself on its independent foreign policy and its opposition to nuclear war, but without much to where public debate or discussion, New Zealand has become an active participant in the war against Russia on the side of Ukraine. Um, Matt will discuss some important issues this raises for future foreign defense policy, and importantly, what needs to be done to bring the war to an end. So welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. I wonder if we could start with you just, just telling us a bit about your background uh, as a peace activist and where that led you uh, in your early years? Well, my introduction to politics in New Zealand was uh, through uh, the Labour Party, actually. And perhaps one other little thing that I should tell people is that I am an immigrant from Australia uh, as a teenager. I've been here for a very long time since then, and I presume will end my days here uh, with a family. But one of the motivations for my parents wanting to come to New Zealand was that I was eligible for the draft uh, in Australia once I turned 18 uh, to the war in Vietnam. So when I came to New Zealand, I, I was still quite young, but they saw that in the future. And my father had been a soldier in the Second World War in the Middle East and on the Kokoda Trail. And he had very strong opinions on these issues. So it had an influence on me. But I joined the Labour Party in the Princess Street branch, and it had luminaries like uh, Michael Bassett, uh, Jonathan Hunt, um, and, and others, who, uh, Jim Holt, and uh, older than me, and Richard Northey. Uh, Richard, I think, was the secretary of the Princess Street branch. It was a stroppy branch of the Labour Party, and I'm sure those who are on here are on more respectable branches. Uh, <laughs> but that was my introduction, and it was in the middle of the war uh, against Vietnam. And most of our young people uh, growing our hair very long and, uh, oh yeah, Phil Goff was there as well. And Helen Clark, I left out so many <laughs> people. Um, but the war in Vietnam was the big issue. And we, most all of the younger people were very annoyed really at um, the members of parliament who'd come down from the Labour Party and were talking about this negotiation and that negotiation. We just wanted the war to end. But anyway, it was big. And from there, I also became the coordinator of the uh, Auckland Mobilisation Committee against the war. And it was the first time in my life and only time probably that uh, as the chairperson, Helen Clark had to sit there and be quiet because she was in the audience of our meetings. Uh, not that she was, and Phil and other people. It was very broad. Oh, even Murray McCulley uh, joined that uh, committee. That's, that was my introduction to a big mass organization to end or take a part in New Zealand's ending participation and internationally. And from there, I became interested in uh, nuclear issues. And Richard Northey was quite an influence because Richard seemed to mean everything. He was in care. Uh, he was my tutor at the university. Um, and he took a leading role then in uh, the issues of nuclear weapons. And I would say that that was the start well, there were many people in New Zealand active, of course, uh, but uh, Richard built upon that and was one of the key people later on, on in Parliament uh, to bring in the nuclear-free New Zealand legislation. Um, other things that are involved in so many, but, but the issues of peace were writ very large because, of course, as our participants tonight will know, uh, New Zealand had been uh, pretty strong member of the Cold War Club on the side of the United States and the United Kingdom. And in the period past the Second World War, apart from uh, those like my father, who was actually not a Cold War warrior, it, it was quite a difficult period because any questions of peace were often met with, well, you have to be with the United States because they saved us from the Second World War uh, and such things. Uh, that was always brought out in the other Thing that was always brought out on questions of peace, that if we didn't take part in a military alliance 
uh, particularly led by the United States and ANZUS, that uh, the Chinese were just about to invade and Russia was about to invade. I say that seriously because that was often brought up and then you will be told when you're arguing for peace or a different course, independent course for New Zealand, that, uh, um, that you were giving comfort to the Russians and the Chinese. Why didn't you go and live there? I remember those <laughs> types of comments, but nevertheless, obviously a, a big movement built in New Zealand where there was a desire to change that type of thinking and see if New Zealand could be part of a worldwide movement for peace. Or perhaps one other thing I should put in there is that in the 80s, uh, wars were raging in Central America. Uh, the war, Nicaragua had a revolutionary government of the Sandinistas. And we formed a Labour Party, Nicaragua Solidarity Committee uh, to, to, to give solidarity in Nicaragua, but also to raise the questions of uh, peace. Uh, Helen Clark was the chair of that and Margaret Wilson. They both went to Nicaragua. Uh, Helen was a second term uh, member of parliament, uh, 84. And um, that was very broad across the Labour Party. It, it also taught me that you had to really get a debate going in the party because David Lange was nervous having taken on the Americans on the nuclear weapons question. Uh, he didn't want to be seen as poking the Americans. Um, and when the foreign minister of Nicaragua, Descoto, visited, uh, he was brushed off, really. It was quite a strange thing. But that was a peace movement as well. And then following that, uh, continuing, and I was involved in the Labour Party, uh, supporting all the initiatives uh, to get us the nuclear-free legislation um, and very proud of the work that was done by our members of parliament. And I, I think we should remember, as many people on here are Labour Party members, and perhaps not all, but majority of the people on here tonight, that it, a discussion had to be forced because there were many conservative voices, you know, understandably, I suppose, in the party to say, don't rock the boat, um, don't go too far, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here we are now. Uh, the next step for me in terms of having you know, a reasonably large role was to have the honour of being the Minister of Disarmament and Arms Control in the 1999 and, and how did you get to that point? Because I understand you were involved in uh, helping develop the Labour Party or the policy going into the 99 election, which I remember well too. Um, I was, at that time, I was on the council of the party and, and uh, yeah, involved well, in, in, well, in uh, election discussions. The 1996-99 term, we were all in opposition, of course. Mm. But because of MMP, we had a majority uh, of like-minded people on the Foreign Affairs and Defence Select Committee. And Helen was on that. And, and of course, with her background, it was a very strong voice. Uh, Phil Goff was on there. So sometimes it changed around. And we were able to get through in that committee a, uh, a document, a defense, foreign affairs defense document over the uh, opposition of the national members, but they were in a minority. They couldn't cobble together a majority. But it helped us to have talks amongst ourselves as to what sort of policy we wanted as government. Uh, but it, it was interesting. It was important. It was also the, uh, the committee's uh, response. And that document is available, by the way. It, it, it laid the basis of what we were able to do uh, in government. And it set out this, that we recognised that New Zealand... Uh, shouldn't be part of a military bloc. Uh, it would work cooperatively wherever it could. Uh, it would uh, work for complete nuclear disarmament and not be having any nuclear weapons itself, building on our legislation, of course, uh, the 1987 Act, and that our defence force would be one that was based on the army, uh, being able to do peacekeeping work, defence work, and it proved itself in East Timor uh, with that type of work. Uh, that the Navy wouldn't be an offensive, uh, highly costly Navy, which Australia and the United States had obviously previously been pushing upon New Zealand uh, at a very great cost. And a strike force, uh, Air Force, was not the capability that New Zealand needed for its type of um, policy. 
It was a policy too predicated that uh, we would work with the United Nations, uh, peacekeeping uh, within our capabilities. But at the front of that was a political uh, decision that New Zealand's best way of defending both itself and contributing to world peace uh, was to show the rest of the world that it would make its own own decisions. It wouldn't be that we would step back where there was aggression and do what we could. Uh, but And then when I became the Minister for Disarmament and Arms Control, uh, it gave me the authority in world forums uh, to say, not offensively, diplomatically, look, we don't follow the policies of other military blocs. We make up our own mind. And, uh, well, we come later on, I guess, to discussing the war in Iraq. It was the type of policy that said we don't go to an illegal war uh, like Iraq. Uh, yes, because so talk about the war in Iraq. Uh, um, my memory of that time is um, going to a meeting in Canada uh, to discuss uh, whether the union should be involved with the um, NDP, the New Democrat Party, um, and being in a hotel room in Ottawa and watching American television um, over a weekend and coming back and reporting on the conference to the Labour Party caucus and then just uh, sort of some, it flopped out of my head um, uh, uh, an aside that uh, the Americans were going to go to war in Iraq and this was early 2002 because the, the, the television was just wall-to-wall anti-Iraq. And I remember Helen got up in the caucus and said, well, we won't be following them, uh, which I thought was fantastic, to be honest. And, and, uh, and so clearly um, there'd been a lot of thinking about, um, about what was going on. And presumably you were part of that, th those discussions as well. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Can I just link it to the whole period after the 9-11 attacks? Because one of the things about the commitment uh, in Afghanistan was that it was not a commitment to a 20 year war. Uh, everyone will remember, you know, it was a very emotional time uh, seeing what had happened and the death and devastation. But we were also aware that the what had occurred was part of a, a wider set of policies, for instance, the arming of the Mujahideen early on, the blowback that occurred, um, and that in power in the United States was the neoconservatives who were, had been pushing before 9-11 for a war against uh, Iraq. They wanted to take out Saddam Hussein. There were published documents uh, on this. That that's what they were going to do. So we were all well aware of the dangers. And uh, we're, I just won't go long on this, but when we took that decision, it was quite an emotional time, I remember, it was following the United Nations or the Security Council resolution uh, that uh, Osama bin Laden could be arrested and all those involved in the Taliban government removed as harboring people who carried out these actions to harm the whole world. It was not an authorization for a continuing war. And that was what it was, was. And I remember giving a speech in Parliament to say, we would do this, but it wasn't on the road to Iraq. We weren't, I, I said that, and I'm sure others did as well because that was the discussion in the cabinet that was very specific, very clear. So people could have different views on it, but it wasn't uh, a war. It was, a I think it was called a special operation, something like that. And anyway, when we came to Iraq, um, it was very clear. And that's where the policy guideline of New Zealand's independence uh, was so important and is important when we come to discuss the war in the Ukraine. Uh, we were very clear, all of us uh, across the parties, that... Um, it was an illegal act. It didn't have the authority of the United Nations. There were no weapons of mass destruction proved, et cetera, of the lies. We should also remember that the heavy laying down of barrage of propaganda by the Murdoch papers. <laughs> I read a report where the Daily Sun editor said you know, of the 175 papers he controlled across the world, and I guess other media, they were all given the drum to beat, go into Iraq, go into Iraq. So it wasn't as though there wasn't a heavy media push outside of New Zealand uh, for this. And we should also remember that the National Party, apart from one vote, I think it might have been uh, Morris Williamson, I'm not sure, only had one vote against going to Iraq. So yeah. it wasn't unanimous, but it was, as you said, with Helen, didn't need any second thoughts. This was an illegal war. It was the wrong thing. 
and New Zealand shouldn't be contributing uh, to that. Okay, well, before we go on to discuss the, the current situation in the, in the war in Ukraine, just to, to tell people that uh, we, we'll go through a discussion with Matt and then there'll be opportunity for questions. So if you'd like to put uh, any questions you have in the chat and then we'll pick them up uh, uh, when we get uh, further on in the discussion. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that at the start. Um, okay, so the thing that you you wrote a, an article recently, Matt, in the uh, Dominion Post. I um, uh, can't remember the headline, but but I remember some of the key lines that New Zealand was was sleepwalking into war with um, Russia, uh, and that this was uh, uh, involved nuclear uh, alliance issues and a, a loss of independence for New Zealand. And and so I'd just uh, be interested if you just. You know, go into the sorts of things that you were discussing in that article and, and the reasons why. Well, I was very shocked to uh, follow the debate. I, I watched it on television uh, in the parliament. In fact, it wasn't a debate. It was about two hours long. Mm -hmm. On first started with the sanctioned bills on Russia. I was very conscious that even though of our opposition to the United States and their allies' intervention in, in Iraq, we didn't call for sanctions on them, and I don't think anybody else did. They might have, but we didn't in New Zealand. Um, and that the debate in Parliament was quite extensive um, and research on the issues. You know, I think people did it. I certainly did a whole lot of background reading. What struck me about the debate, or I call it an event, it wasn't a debate. Everybody said the same thing, which the, the, the word used was unprovoked aggression of, the, of Russia. Now, I'm an international lawyer, and there's argument over whether the Russians violated uh, Article 2. Quite strong opinion they did. There's, but there's arguments to say that they had the right under Article 51. There's arguments on that. And there are people who, on the question of the Ukraine, I mean, uh, when I say people, particularly scholars and journalists and others, uh, who hold an opinion that Russia did not have a legal right, but they understood that NATO had played a very provocative role. So what I, when I heard every single member of parliament say unprovoked aggression, I thought, well, hang on one moment. You may come to the, the conclusion it was aggression, but surely you can't say unprovoked, whether they should have been provoked, but you can't say unprovoked if you have a look at the context. And that where I thought was the sleepwalking because without, in my opinion, thought on the complexities of what had led to the issues of the Ukraine, without any reference, for instance, to the Minsk agreements of 2014, which recognized and was signed by the Kiev government, as well as Russia and uh, by others, well, the, the representative of the, of the OSCE, the European Security Organization, that there would be autonomy of the Donbass republics, that there were big issues and that uh, Ukraine should be given support uh, not to have a civil war. It was breached very quickly, a great war developed. And in the Donbass, the destruction and the war, if anyone had followed, had been going on for eight long years uh, with a death toll of 14,000, the figures of the Kiev government and the United Nations. Prior to that, if we went back to 1991, the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. Uh, it was a promise to the Russians uh, that NATO wouldn't extend one inch further than East Germany. Well, it did more than that. It marched right up to the border of Russia. Russian governments, whether it was President Putin or if it had been anybody else, were talking about their security concerns that we've got this on our border. We see it as a threat. has been poo-pooed by NATO, poo-pooed by others. And... Perhaps we'll come to it later, but it also involved uh, questions of uh, nuclear weapons because of the uh, scrapping of the later 2019, but it, the process began before that, 2018, of the inter Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, uh, which, which banned uh, short-range yeah. missiles. Um, this is all gone. The security for Russia was a big question. So my point is that our parliament, in my opinion, abrogated its responsibility to have a, a fire and a full discussion 
we're going to put sanctions on the Russians. Uh, should we discuss other violations? Uh, so perhaps the, the most obvious to people is that of the Iraq war and other violations of, of, of the war in Yugoslavia it was not one that was mandated by the United Nations and the dismemberment of, of, of Yugoslavia. Now, all of these questions are open to debate and people can come to different conclusions, but our parliament did not even discuss it before we had a sanctions. And then we've moved from there, of course, now to training howitzers, giving $13 million. In my opinion, and I draw on some of my knowledge as, a, as an international lawyer, we've declared war on Russia. So it's very, it's a very serious uh, circumstance we've got ourselves into. And perhaps one other thing I could mention, there was no discussion in the parliament. As I say, they didn't mention, nobody mentioned the Minsk agreements, which should have been mentioned as part of, the, of what has led to this, the, the violation of them. But secondly, there didn't seem to be any awareness that we are a cooperating non-member, I think it's called non-member cooperating global partner of the NATO, which is the biggest nuclear arm bloc in the world. And we are a country with a legislation which says we will not have nuclear weapons. And without a discussion, without a thought to how serious this is, mm -hmm. without any discussion about it actually kneecaps. I was thinking of myself as the Minister for Disarmament. I would have been kneecapped by this because I had to conflict, not, not in a diplomatic way, you know, when I say conflict, to discuss, argue with NATO representatives. Because if anybody reads NATO's communiques, a very important one in uh, 2021, June, it attacks vehemently the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which we have signed up to, and our minister, uh, Phil Twyford, as the Minister of Disarmament and Arms Control, is promoting in the world. So there's quite a lot I put in there, but I'm just trying to lay the basis of what I'm saying is that so much has been left out of the discussion in Parliament, in the Labour Party. How did we move from our position in the 1990? Uh, government when the Labour the government came in to a position where we've moved into a nuclear armed bloc which has a strategy not just for Europe but we'll come to it I guess but the Indo-Pacific region. Well I think and I think uh, I think that's the, the key thing for me there is the uh, two things first of all uh, the absence of a, of a debate in what is perhaps for New Zealand obviously for other countries as well. But for New Zealand, the, you know, the most significant um, uh, shift in our, um, uh, our kind of uh, stance in the world. And even more importantly than that, uh, uh, certainly we are active, um, active participants in this uh, war. It, it removes our, our traditional search for a voice, independent voice for peace or at least makes it much more difficult to, to uh, find that voice and express that voice. And that is where I think we do absolutely need to be having a debate among ourselves in, the, in, 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 in every forum in New Zealand, because it, the, the, uh, the, it, it isn't um, any more like it was back in the uh, 1980s that you describe and I remember so well as well. So. So it's, it's um, uh, to bring that, to, and, and, and perhaps that brings up, you know, in terms of allowing us to have a debate, is the role of the media in, in uh, all of this. Because um, as I indicated, I could tell after a weekend in Ottawa that there was going to be a war because of a highly convergent media. And I think we, we also in New Zealand have a very convergent media that is, really telling one side of the story and not uh, and leaving out um, many of the other things that, that you've mentioned. So I'd just want to be interested if you just make a comment on, on how you see that um, playing well, out in the moment. I will, and just so I don't lose the thread, I, I want to come back to the importance of New Zealand having an independent foreign policy if we are going to be accepted as a mediator, as we were in Bergenville 
uh, but we're now damaged goods. And in uh, legal terms, uh, there's a term called equity, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. Uh, we've always admonished, you must come to the table with clean hands. Uh, we can't do that now. We can't play that role. Um, if we decided we didn't want to do it, well, that was okay, but there's been no debate whether New Zealand wants to step back from the ability to be seen as, a, as an independent force. But to the media, well, I, I was going to say I've been shocked, but perhaps I should expect it. At the climate of fear and terror that's been <clears throat> laid down upon us uh, in discussing the Ukraine. And if you, I've, I've spoken out uh, and I have been told that I'm uh, by various people. In fact, one commentator who commented for the Labour Party, that I was a Russian troll, an agent of President Putin. The last time I looked in my bank account, I had no rubles placed in there, but uh, I'm sure I'll have trouble cashing them if I do. And that remind, that's why it takes me back to my early days as a peace activist, uh, to be accused of being a, a communist stooge, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got it all laid down. And now we're back to that. A leading journalist who did uh, interview me uh, told me that he had to fight to get the opinion that I was giving on this, but he had to argue that you have to have some balance. When he finally got the interview and the article there, the pressure went on him, he has since told me, uh, to get more balance. And he had to put in Jerry Brownlee and some other people and, whatever, and other academics who, who were for New Zealand's present position. Um, that shows you the level, in my opinion, of intimidation the fact that RT has gone off our screens. Now, I like RT. It's a good break from living channel, uh, chefs programs, uh, celebrity, dancing with the stars, whatever. Um, and I make up my own mind whether I think, oh, they're just parroting something. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that did, uh, I was always appreciative and helped me to follow for the journalists who went into the conflict areas in the Ukraine. I think some of them lost their lives in that period, 2014, uh, to, to the present day uh, of the war there. So come back to that. And throughout the world, uh, I've got friends in, in Europe. I actually have a friend uh, who's a dissident in Moscow. He's a it's an economics professor. Uh, he, he, he conflicts with the United Party because he's a socialist and an atheist, not in the Russian Orthodox Church. But he's, he's free to say what he wants. Um, and they've told me of the, uh, in the, the ones in Western Europe where my son, one of my oldest son lives, the same thing as in New Zealand. A barrage of there's only one narrative and that if you dare to raise other issues, well, give an example. If you start talking about the Nazi influence, you're told this is nonsense, that there's no Nazi influence. Well, the BBC in 2014 had a very good Newsnight article on it. And so now time. The media, that what do you think the media should be doing? Because I think it also raises the question of, of what's, what's behind uh, what's going on in, in Russia. Uh, is this because we've also got to think about um, China uh, and the, the same kind of process that seems to be going on in relation to China. So do you, what, what, how, how would we get a more balanced media, uh, do you think, or at least a, a different, a, a range of opinions from a range of sources that well, would yes, be able to do? I mean, it does, <laughs> the, the accusation about, you know, President Putin does this and President Putin does that, and, I haven't, you know, that is to some extent that's a separate question. The discussion people have on what's happening in Russia, but there's plenty of uh, informed uh, people to give other opinions and often well-researched opinions, agree or disagree. For instance, there are a range of American his historians, there's professors at the Missouri University. There's John Mishimer at Chicago University. There was Stephen Cohen, unfortunately died. There's Professor Richard Falk. Um, who thinks that Russia, his opinion as international lawyers, should, has breached Article 2, but Carrot talks about the role of NATO undermining everything and pushing uh, a strategy which is dangerous. This, they could even have Kissinger on, who's come out <laughs> against the present policy. Uh, America's uh, Ambassador Jack Matlock. 
I won't go on, but the, yeah. there was plenty of well-informed scholars, commentators to allow us to make up our own mind. Uh, and they're not on our programs. Could easily be on, on television in New Zealand. It's got a responsibility, I believe, uh, to, to have such programs so important uh, on, on all our media, but it's not there. You have to go searching on the internet. And if you go searching, some platforms have been what they call deplatformed, I believe, uh, demonetized. People have you know, PayPal shut them down if they're independent or, or mm. contrary commentators. We have, so it's on a number of various levels that we have an, a need for an urgent discussion, I believe, in the Labour Party. What is happening? What has happened to our party not to have uh, a discussion? With, we're talking about war and peace, and you've mentioned China. We'll come back to that. Uh, we have an arms race going on in the Pacific. We have an arms race. We have a defence paper, which is influential with uh, Pene Hanere. We've discussed this on a policy call with him calling for us to up the amount of money that we spend on defense uh, and get high technological weapons. We've been admonished by Kurt Campbell, the State Department's man now in the Pacific, to carry out the, the Asia pivot, that we have to start thinking about hard security. I think that means killing more people. So there's a lot. So, okay, yes, there's, there certainly is. So, so Going to the other side, then, what do you think um, people who want to see peace in the world and an and independent role for Aotearoa New Zealand, what should, be, what should we be saying and doing now to, see if, to, to, to bring about um, peace? Because it's not, going to be, it's not going to be easy. And there's no, you know, the, the, there's, um, the, there's no... Um, no likelihood of, of, of easy of victory on one side or the other. There's no likelihood that the, the endless, another endless war in Europe would be a, a disaster for everybody concerned. So what should be the sort of thing that we should be doing if we want to see uh, right. this war have... come to an end and peace uh, in our region and in the world? I think there's a lot we can do. I think for the first thing that New Zealand can do uh, and this is the responsibility of the Labour Party, is back off the position we've got of going into, into NATO and, uh, and not being independent. It's going to take some courage for our leaders to do it. Our ministers have to stop the mindless mantra of sharing like-minded values with Australia and the, and, and the United States when we don't all, and we do, of course, in many ways, but we're talking about the issues of war. So we could make a big difference. I believe that across the world, the uh, scales are dropping from people's eyes on these topics. It always happens. It happened with the war against Vietnam. I mean, the American war against Vietnam. People, first of all, believe the communists are coming. Uh, we have to be there. And then the truth started coming out and policy started to change. If we in New Zealand, in our party, in our government, will have the courage to say we're not taking part in this arms race, we're, 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 we're not going to do it, we're not going to make an enemy of China and Russia, that doesn't stop us criticising anything we want to about those countries or any other countries. But if we say we're not going to join in the um, myth and the, the war drum being beaten about China, uh, it's aggressive, et cetera, et cetera, and start demanding that we be a party of peace again, we can have an effect. I also believe that we can join There's hundreds of thousands of people in Australia uh, who are like-minded, <laughs> like us, and, and we can galvanise, we can work with them around the world. Uh, and so what if New Zealand does it and says, look, we're not taking part in preparing for a war against China, that's going to have quite an effect. If we say the same uh, in, in the question of the, the war in the Ukraine, that we want to be part of the, the peace party, uh, let's have peace discussions. Noam Chomsky recently made something which I thought was very, was he, as he usually is, uh, as a scholar. He said, how interesting it is in the United States that the only voice for peace negotiation in the Ukraine is Donald Trump. And he made it very clear that he has nothing in common with Donald Trump on any other issue. He said, but don't shoot the messenger. Um, and now, of course, he's been joined by Kissinger, 
this hasn't got a good record in my opinion, and others. So your question, I, I don't wish to be so vague on it, but it starts with us in our own party, in our governing party in New Zealand, having a firm discussion and refusing to take part in this drive to war. And that's what it is around the world. It's a drive uh, to war. And it, it's the key question, the existential question, because at the end of it, it, if we don't stop the arms race and we don't take a step, is it possible nuclear war? Okay, we, we, we've got a question here from uh, Kay Weir, um, which is saying, um, uh, hold on, just let me, oh. is, is New Zealand violating uh, nuclear free legislation, especially the non proliferation treaty, do you think? Hmm. Well, it's a very good question and should be um, examined. We're not technically, because the legislation is very constrained and says we can't have nuclear weapons on New Zealand soil or aid or abet the manufacturing. But, this, but the, the thrust of this uh, legislation um, is that New Zealand will be a part, uh, first of all, an upholder of the uh, non-proliferation treaty. Uh, we've built on it since with the signing of the Treaty of the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons, a key part of our foreign policy. And there is a contradiction clearly in being part military part, because we have documents that signed us up to NATO, and it, it says that we will have military interoperability with NATO. NATO is a nuclear armed force and the biggest in the world. So, yes, I agree with Kay that there uh, certainly breaches, at least in the spirit. I couldn't go so far to say you'd win a court case uh, on it because it, it's related to what is on New Zealand's soil. And uh, it doesn't go further and say that, but it does say that we can't, you know, we're not supposed to be a part of uh, nuclear armed actions. And we've, well, not that they're being used, but we are part of a, of a force which relies on nuclear weapons. So that should be certainly part of the discussion. Okay, so there's another question here from Bob Beachy. Does any peace treaty not pass Donbass, et cetera, to Russia and have a pro-Russia puppet, puppet leader in Ukraine? I think that's a question about where, where the, if there's to be a negotiated settlement, um, or at least a negotiated end to the war and a settlement, uh, what are going to be the uh, likely or possible um, implications for the, the territorial? So certainly at the moment, uh, it would seem that the, um, east, uh, the, the Donbass area of Ukraine is now under pretty much under Russian control with the, with the sort of battles raging fiercely at the moment. And it looks like the uh, Ukrainians retreating. So um, what, what, what's your view on where, where a peace settlement in Ukraine might um, land or might have to land? And what are the implications behind that? Well, every war that I've known of uh, ends in some sort of negotiation. Uh, and compromises are often made by all parties to, to have peace. I mean, the Vietnamese did that uh, in Venice ways um, and across, across the world. In the Ukraine, uh, the question, Bob, is, first of all, uh, some people would say they're puppets. Others would say they're not. And you have to start having some facts come out and allowing a whole range of people to speak, including citizens of those areas. There can be referendums to establish whether or not uh, people want this particular government. But what should be remembered is that there was a solemn international agreement agreed to by Kiev that the Donbass areas should have autonomous status and that there had been very large defections from the Ukrainian army uh, to those Donbass republics. Defections, which is why the uh, Ukrainian army at the time got beaten and pushed out of large areas of the Donbass, because there was 
uh, a militia. There weren't Russian troops. There weren't. The, I'm not saying that Russia wasn't involved. I mean, this gets down to discussion on facts on the ground, etc. But there were largely Ukrainian, uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians and others. I'm not sure all of the, the factors involved. So that's that's one. That's part of the discussion. Uh, it, will there be refer- Will there be internationally supervised referendums? That could be part of it. And whatever, uh, if it is just a, a situation where we're going to continue this war, well, then the facts will be now that uh, the Russia and the republics there, because there's also fighters from those two uh, republics of uh, Donetsk and, and Lugansk, um, they've already, you know, Mariupol's no longer in Kiev's hands, uh, neither is this large stretch uh, across there. So the military fact will be that unless you're going to have an all-out scale war with NATO pouring in there with its own troops, um, that there will have to be uh, an agreement for all of the peoples of the Ukraine. And I would suggest that this is where the question of arming the most ideologically hardened fighters of the far right and the Nazis will have to be taken into account as well, because that question exercises a range of people in the Ukraine. It's not just propaganda. Time magazine shows that. And they have operated death squads across the Ukraine for a very long time. And so that'll be part of the discussion. Yeah, and I I guess the the issue there is is, is, um, some kind of, is, is some kind of settlement like that preferable to endless war uh, and and that that so that we can actually look at um, getting some end point to the uh, to the fighting and then sorting out and I think it is it is important to note that the um, certainly in the Crimea there was a referendum uh, as I understand it uh, that argued for that resulted in a, a choice of uh, uh, staying within Russia. Okay, another question, is it possible that there is a drive to war partly to boost demand in the international economy? Are there some, well, and I think it's an important question actually, are, are, the, are there some in, economic um, interests involved in this war and, and uh, behind the scenes perhaps? Uh, for example, um, what, what's going to happen to energy supplies, the price of oil and the price of gas? What's going to happen to food supplies? Uh, who benefits from the closure of the HS2 um, pipeline, gas pipeline from Russia to Germany? So, so are there some international uh, economic influences perhaps behind the scenes, do you think? Well, certainly if we take that, uh, perhaps the the uh, economic interest that stands out the most was the Nord gas pipeline from Russia into, into Europe. Before this current stage of the war, it was a long stated uh, policy of the United States to stop that. And they were pushing uh, Europe for a long time not to allow this to go ahead and using all sorts of arguments. Uh, American gas suppliers, of course, are the ones who would step in uh, to to, to meet this. Uh, so that's one economic interest. Uh, the question of, uh, of food supplies, uh, yes, I mean, well, that's actually interesting on another angle, and that is the blame for Russia of the, <laughs> of the wheat uh, food crisis in the world. Before this broke out, there was a food crisis in the world with people being hungry and not having enough to, uh, to eat. So there's a lot more to food crisis than this. And, and, what about, and what about the, um, the uh, well, the military weapons industry, shall we say, yes, and, well, and, and, that's, that's, and possibly that's, the, and the implications for, for, you know, implications for New Zealand. I mean, one thing that strikes me is that, that uh, uh, there is a view that NATO has been strengthened uh, by this because there's going to be an immense amount of more money poured into um, European um, uh, defence budgets, except that NATO hasn't been involved, or at least openly involved, in the in the actual fighting in Ukraine, uh, 
although obviously it's active behind the scenes. And, and, and so, yes, so what are the, and, 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 and from that, or also from that, in terms of New Zealand's, do we expect to see uh, calls for more higher, greater defence expenditure in New Zealand because of because of this, and because and and what should again should be our reaction to that? Well, back to the the, the economic emphasis. Clearly, the uh, military industrial complex. Uh, call, I think they call it the military industrial congressional complex in the United States stands to benefit from any military expenditure. But not only those, the weapons industries in the Scandinavian countries, Sweden's got a big weapons industry, uh, the United Kingdom has got one, France has got one, they all, and Germany is now ramping up uh, as well uh, in this regard, and there's other suppliers, the Czechs have a small arms industry as well. So yes, for a lot of people there's money to be made, and uh, pouring them in, they're going to get destroyed in the Ukraine, you've got to replace them. So you give it to the Ukraine, but you also have to then replace them in your own uh, countries. Uh, yes, there's a definite economic uh, benefit to war for the war industries. And uh, in the United States, it's well known the power that they have across the, the Congress uh, for ever and ever, the budget going up. And with the, the recent military expenditure in the United States, they already outspend the United States uh, 760-odd billion, I think which is more than the next 11 countries combined uh, in terms of military expenditure. So the war has got multiple levels of behind it, both the strategic papers written by the United States to say, we're not gonna have a strategic competitor, uh, China and countries being forced to take sides. Uh, coming back to New Zealand, the pressure that's going on here, this brings us, I think, back to our own country. The pressure going on is you must choose sides. That's what we're being told. It's, um, that you're going to have two sides. And that means economic sides as well. Clearly, there's nervousness amongst New Zealand businesses with our commitments and the, the benefit of having trade with uh, China. So we can remember Phil Goff in 2008, I think, signing the first free trade agreement, the jubilation about it. And there was reasons for that. And John Key joined in on national became government. That's all a threat now. And we've got these vague promises that as if we should be induced by them, that there'll be a new trade framework with the Americans will lead in the Pacific. Uh, but the pressure is go, will go on for higher uh, defence spending. NATO wants its members, we're not a member, we're just a non-cooperating global partner, but it wants its members to have 2% uh, uh, spending of GDP, which is an enormous amount. And for New Zealand, uh, that is going to, that's in the, defense paper, people should read that, you can get it online, 2021, it's influential with the government, Penny Henare certainly supports it, he's our Minister of Defense, uh, they want high-end technological weapons, uh, a lot of money goes into that, so you've got to start thinking guns or butter, which one is it? Okay, one more question, and perhaps we'll, we'll take this as the last one. And that leads us back to our role as in, in what can we do for peace? And this comes from Sarah B. New Zealand has now lost the opportunity to have a leading role in mediating and resolution because of our taking sides. How do we organize to lobby, et cetera, Labour MPs to reverse the policy? And this will be, yeah, so. All right, so look, I just want to pick up on taking sides. Um, we can take sides, we can take sides for peace, we can still be critical, but what we want is that uh, independence, uh, and, and you're quite right uh, for that. And how do we change it? How do we get New Zealand back to the path that we did chartered? And instead of reverting to, we're reverting to what we were in the 50s and the 60s, uh, that is just following the line uh, coming out of in the interests of Washington. And by the way, when you're in NATO, uh, you're locked, getting locked into, you lose your independence, you're getting locked into a strategy, uh, into a set of policies that get beyond your control, it's spinning out of control. It's almost like before the First World War, the alliances were there and people just got dragged into it. That's happening right in front of our eyes. We need the discussion going into the Labour Party as we had in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. That's what changed Labour Party policy. Before that, the older generation, before Norm Kirk, uh, were wedded to the argument, you have to stay in ANZUS, we have to be there, we have to follow that line. Um, and so the, it's 
a very important role for the Labour Party membership. For the trade unions who are affiliated to the Labour Party, uh, peace and war are integral to their members, to the country, uh, internationally. And so I would say the responsibility lies with us to ensure that we have an open, lengthy, lengthy, because there's a lot of things to cover, and generous debate on this uh, on this question. That's the key thing. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, look, Matt. Um, thank you very much for for uh, that uh, your uh, exposition of uh, ideas and principles and and indeed examples for us to do. Um, I think I think I, I absolutely agree with you that that we do need to have a debate. It needs to be extensive. Uh, it is not easy at the moment to to uh, continue it because there, there is a very convergent um, view, in my opinion. But um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for for uh, what you're doing. Uh, back to your principles of the um, the uh, what it was, the Princess Street branch in the uh, in the 1980s, and those those years that I remember well as well, when uh, we were uh, strong advocates for peace. And in my view, the time has come for us and for everybody else. Uh, and thanks to all the people who've joined our discussion tonight. Uh, there's a big task ahead of us, um, and, but peace has to be our um, sole objective. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Matt, again, and good night, everybody. Uh, we'll stop there. Thank you.